Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Simon Parker. I'm a, a broadcaster and a journalist and a travel writer. And I am, quite honestly, relentlessly restless. On a day-by-day, -day, sometimes even hour-by-hour -hour basis, I am wrestling with the, the need and the desire to be somewhere else. Now, this is quite honestly an affliction. I really do feel like I have some of the itchiest feet known to man. And while I feel like modern society and modern culture wants, wants me and wants all of us to be in one place, that is the pinnacle of happiness and contentment and to be grounded, all I ever want to do is move. When I'm moving, I really feel like I'm getting the most out of my life. When I'm stationary, I really feel like I'm beginning to stagnate, almost. It's like I'm wading through creative treacle, like I'm cycling into gale force winds. Oh, this wind is absolutely fierce. As I've come round this headland, all of a sudden, I'm no longer protected, and I'm being absolutely battered by the Arctic chill. Woo! This all began when I set off to hitchhike around Australia and New Zealand when I was a 19-year-old. And all I had was a backpack stuffed with clothes and a few hundred pounds in my pocket. And all I had was the very vague idea of just wanting to be somewhere different tomorrow than the place I happened to find myself that day. And I remember at the end of my teens, I was just so full of angst and anxiety and, and restlessness. And all I wanted to do was just go to the other side of the world and just see what was going on with my own eyes. So for a year, I hitchhiked from one end of Australia to the other, and then from the very northern point of New Zealand all the way to the south. And I slept on beaches, on benches, I lived on a commune, I, uh, I worked on a sheep farm, on a mussel barge. And at the end of that year, I fully expected to return back to the UK. And like a lot of people who go away on these young adult adventures, to have that wanderlust just somehow contained within me and suppressed within my personality. Well, for the two or three years that followed, I did manage to achieve that because it coincided with me getting my first, uh, my first break, really, as a journalist and a news producer in the very busy and frantic and often very exciting environments of central London. And I really felt like I was actively involved in all of those things that I felt I was missing out on because I was dealing with reports coming from all over the world. However, I was simultaneously managing to conform to the way I thought my life was going to play out in a stationary place with an apartment, friends and family around me. That's how I thought my life was going to play out. At the same time, though, I couldn't shift this lingering feeling of imbalance in my life. And I remember speaking to friends and colleagues who used to tell me how going to the same place every day, seeing the same people, having a novelty office mug and a salary at the end of the month, it, it used to give them a feeling of contentment and ease. Whereas honestly, the whole thing just massively served to freak me out. I remember just thinking to myself, you know, is this the existence that I've created for myself? At the same time, I also couldn't shift this lingering feeling of FOMO, the fear of missing out. And we hear that so much these days, FOMO. And I remember how I used to work in the newsroom in the middle of the night, and these reports used to come in. And I was just growing increasingly more jealous day on day, dealing with these reports coming from journalists who were seeing and hearing and experiencing a story with their 
with their own senses. And I was sat in the newsroom dealing with all these things. And I just used to ask myself, why? Why am I sat here, often in the middle of the night, dealing with these reports, when in theory, I could be out there myself, doing what they're doing? So one particularly disgruntled late night in the newsroom, I quite literally just pulled my debit card from my pocket, and I picked a country and a continent totally at random, Peru in South America. I then sent a very quick email to my editor, and I said, I'm terribly sorry, but um, I appear to have just bought a one-way ticket to South America. Uh, and uh, I'm leaving in five weeks. I'm not sure if I'm going to come back. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Now, that was, in retrospect, the most important and most liberating few minutes of my life. It was the moment I began to rethink and reconstruct my pathway in life and the pathway I thought I was going to take. It was the moment I decided that this feeling of anxiety and restlessness didn't have to be perceived by me any longer as a negative personality trait that I had to suppress within me. Yeah, my friends and my family and most people in the culture that we are a part of have opted to live and work and reside in one place. But I figured then, and I still do now, that until I do or perhaps don't find that same feeling, then I should channel this feeling, this natural feeling of restlessness, into something that can ultimately be positive in my life. I've gone on to report from over 60 countries on six continents, and I've now been to over half the countries on the planet. And at times, it's been, quite honestly, incredible and exciting and exhilarating. At others, it's been really rather ludicrous. This is, this is me describing to a BBC World Service audience of about 300 million people about the joys of ice fishing in the very high reaches of the Arctic Circle in temperatures of about minus 30 degrees. And what I really love about going out into the world and being able to report on places like this is just how creative you have to be with your, with your words and your adjectives, because you've got to remember the people that you're potentially broadcasting to, 300 million people around the world, people in Mumbai and Nairobi and Sao Paulo and Lima. I'm having to try and describe to them this, this place, which for most people is very hard for them to, to fathom in their imaginations. For some weird reason, I am just naturally drawn to places that are really rather inhospitable. This is me in the Atacama Desert on a story I was working on a few years ago. And this is the highest and driest desert on the planet. And this place plays absolute havoc with the human body. My skin was dry, my throat was parched, my eyes had lost all the moisture in their eyelids. It was a really disgusting, horrible place. And I remember how the mucus in my face would coagulate and become all sticky and horrible. But I am an absolute sadist for these places because I keep going back for more. People who work in this industry and the colleagues who are my peers in this industry, we discuss it and we really are absolute gluttons for punishment. I've cycled across the United States, solo and unsupported. And I've driven a tiny rickshaw, three-wheeled rickshaw, uh, with just uh, seven horsepower from the Himalayas all the way to the southern point of India. On both of those occasions, I was always totally amazed at how interested everyone was in the journeys that I was undertaking. And what I've learned by taking on this nomadic lifestyle is that there seems to be something very human about someone who is living nomadically with all of their possessions in a bag or on bags on the back of a, back of a bike, which immediately people just want to warm to you and be nice to you. And wherever I am around the world, I'm always surprised 
at how human beings will always open their doors or open their arms and try and be nice to me wherever I am. That's footage of me at the time, rather unsuccessfully learning how to become a, a paragliding pilot in the, uh, in the Colombian Andes. And this existence has not come without its, uh, its near-death experiences. And there was a moment as I was barreling through the air, and I was thinking to myself, you know, I'm falling down this cliff, I'm back on to gravity, and um, I'm about to break my back. Uh, thankfully, after two or three seconds, I did realize that I had all my faculties and I could, I could touch my toes and everything. And, um, and then I had to go through three hours of embarrassment as a group of local farmers had to then come in, hack me out of the jungle with machetes as all manner of tropical creepy crawly was trying to invite itself into every possible orifice. And, um, and I was thinking to myself as I was suspended there, hanging upside down, tangled up in, in all sorts of horrible things, thinking to myself, what on earth have you got yourself into? Surely, maybe going back to the newsroom has got to be a little bit more uh, preferable to this. I've asked myself that same question on dozens and dozens of occasions, and not least when I followed a group of sailors as they, uh, they raced 7,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean at the end of the winter in 2016. Now, believe it or not, that is a good day in the Pacific. And... Um, yeah, for, for 28 days, I lived on board with a group of sailors as they were racing across the Pacific in the clip around the world yacht race. And it really does rank as the worst month of my life. However, at the same time as that being the worst month of my life personally, professionally, it ranks as a, a, real, a great privilege to get to see and experience places like that with my own with my own body, with my own eyes and my own brain, because that was what I was really jealous of when I was sat dealing with all these reports of foreign correspondents back in the newsrooms of central London. And when I, when I reached uh, the US coast after 7,000 nautical miles of sailing, I was emaciated. I'd lost 10 kilos in weight through incapacitating bouts of seasickness every single day. However, when I got there, there was this sense of pride that I'd been able to witness and feel what the center of the Pacific Ocean feels and look like, looks like and sounds like. The roar of the, of the waves is just so indescribable, but that is what I was always longing for. What I've realized, though, is that when I'm in a mad rush and I'm chasing a story and I'm full of adrenaline or I'm frantically trying to get my tent up at the end of the day, I've realized that this is my normality. And this was the normal that I was deep down always longing to create for myself. And while the majority of people get that feeling of happiness and contentment and being grounded and feeling at home from bricks and mortar and a geographical, geographical location where we can all have our friends and family around us, well, I still do get that same feeling, but I get it from when my tent is up, when my bags are in some sort of order, when my passport is in a zipped up pocket and it's dry, because it's not usually dry, when my clothes are packed in some sort of order and my laptop and my camera are fully charged and ready to go. That's when I'm at my happiest. That's when I feel most content. So what am I getting at with all of this, rather than just standing up here and showing off about all these places I've been and all these things I've done? Well, I do get it. I do understand that life gets in the way for a lot of people, and it's not practical for all of us to 
all of us to be just gallivanting around the world in this fashion. And I do feel immensely privileged and lucky to get to live my life in this way. What I hope my universal message is, which hopefully all of us can adopt in our lives, is one of changing perspectives. Changing perspectives on anything in our lives that just doesn't quite sit right with us. Anything that gives us that feeling of restlessness and anxiousness and anxiety and makes us just keep asking those age-old burning questions of, of what if? What if I went to the other side of the world and tried a different career? What if I invested more time and energy into that friendship or relationship? What if I just tried reading a different type of newspaper? Because all I can tell you is that when I reconstructed my viewpoint on the thing that I'd previously perceived as a negative personality trait, this constant desire to always be something else, and instead of trying to fight it, decided to embrace it, well, all I can tell you is that I haven't looked back since, and I've had a long, long time to sit and ponder this career choice while staring out of plane windows. I hope and I don't think I ever will. Thank you very much.